This video is about corner fillets and radii on machined parts and how some design choices can really impact not only part cost but how well these parts are going to assemble. My goal as a parts provider for customers is not only to get them parts at a reasonable cost but also I never want them to have any surprises at assembly. I want their parts just to go together like Legos for them. And oftentimes that requires looking at what's being machined and what's bolting together and seeing uh, what we can do about some of the radii and how they're going to potentially cause issues. And so uh, let's get started with the most common type, which are probably radii whose axes are parallel to the cutters, rotating axis. And we'll start with external radii. So an external radii uh, in the context of a part which is like gripped in a vise and milled around has no real cost impact. They're pretty much free. You're running a cutter around the part to cut the outer faces and whether you make that corner sharp or rounded really really doesn't affect runtime in any way shape or form. doesn't have any special tooling configure, uh, considerations. Where we do have to worry about external radii like that is on bigger blocks. So in the tooling world, it's not unusual to get your big blocks and plates processed from an outside vendor pre-square. So this is already to the size I gave them. Uh, it might be oversized for heat treat or it might be right on size if it's pre-hard steel. And so like, let's say this was like a stamping die plate. All I'd have to do is come through and add my holes. But if there was a corner radii, I'd have to specifically put that on and blend it to these external flats. Whereas if it's just a chamfer like it is now, the plate vendor will put that on in their, their plate mill. So um, ask if it really needs a, a corner rounded. Uh, like if this were a mold insert and it's going down into a milled cavity, it has to be there, we understand. But uh, if this is just like a stop block on a die or something, then it's just out in there, the chamfer's probably fine. The other situation where you have to really understand what's going on with the external fillet is when it's like a heat treated insert. So that fillet will get rough milled on and it'll grow and heat treat. And then when we grind the sides, all of a sudden the stock on the fillet is a lot heavier than it is in the CAD model and that could cause a problem at assemblies. Um, so know about the heat treat growth, uh, how we typically address that if it's a non-critical fillet, like we're allowed to have a gap between it and the pockets it's going in, we'll machine it under pre-heat treat and enough so that when it grows it's still undersized. If it's a critical fillet we're probably going to grind or hard mill it after heat treat. That's where if you're dealing with heat treat, it sometimes makes sense to deal with a shop that does a lot of heat treated components. Just there's a lot of institutional knowledge like that. So that's external fillets. Uh, let's move into internal fillets like that. So here we have a six millimeter radius fillet that is 45 millimeters deep. So using a 12 millimeter end mill, we're with inside a four times diameter uh, cutter diameter to depth ratio. Uh, that's kind of like the threshold for an easy pass. Like a lot of companies will do 4XD without thinking twice. I go up to like 10XD before I really get concerned, but 10XD is certainly doable, but the cost is starting to really add up there. But 4XD and under, we don't worry about it too much. So you, you probably familiar with that but you may not be familiar with a lot of machinists prefer that the cutter be or the the radius be slightly bigger than the cutter you have in mind so if you think this is going to be cut with a 12x or a 12 millimeter end mill and you have the depth based on that maybe make this corner radius a little bit bigger than six millimeter corner radius um, and here's why so when when a uh, 12 millimeter end mill goes into a six millimeter corner, 90 degrees of the circumference of that end mill is in contact. And 
and when it hits that corner, you can see from this edge to here is now in contact. And when we look at like on a long tool like this, that's a lot of flute engagement. And uh, sometimes you'll hear like a squeal or a chatter, but what it really means is the end mill in the corner relative to the end mill cutting along the flat where it maybe has 10, 20 degrees of engagement is gonna see a lot more deflection. And when you have like a tight fitting insert into a pocket, deflection in the corners like that means stock remaining. And the insert will more than likely bind up on those corner radii. So uh, now if we move over to this corner, we, it was modeled bigger at seven millimeters. And we can see the cutter rolls right through and at no point is more than about 30 degrees of the cutter's circumference engaged in the cut. And so you're going to get a much more even cutter deflection around the perimeter of that pocket. Um, now, if you're a machinist watching this and you get a deep pocket where the corner radii are drawn uh, to the same size as the cutter you have to use, one thing you can do is set up a bore op that cuts to the high limit of the tolerance you have and go through and bore those corners first. And uh, that makes it so when you come back later and machine the pocket with those corners bored out, you're not hitting any big deflection spikes when you go through those corners. Um, so making the corner radius a little bit bigger than the end mill really helps us when fighting deflection. Uh, and then another thing you could do, uh, don't necessarily make it bigger than whatever end mill uh, measurement system you typically think in. So if you're uh, you know, a metric designer, don't make it a little bit bigger than 12 millimeter, make it accommodate inch as well. And I know this is gonna rub you the wrong way, but I work with a lot of uh, companies who design a metric, but have their parts made in America. And um, in America, there's a huge economy of scale in inch-based cutters. They're often the cheapest carbide. And uh, so a lot of shops around here are using inch-based cutters. So we can't get in a half inch cutter into a six millimeter corner radius. We have to go down to three eighths. And all of a sudden that 4XD six millimeter corner radius becomes a bit more of an issue with a three eighths tool. Where if we make that corner radius like a seven millimeter, we can get our half inch tool in there, no problem. This goes the other way. If you're an American designer designing parts which are gonna be made overseas, Instead of doing like a 3 16 corner radius, where a 3 8 end mill would go in, maybe make it like an even 0.2. That way, a 10 millimeter end mill can still get in there with a, a little bit of ability to roll around the corner. Um, you know, it's a, it's a world with two measuring systems, and anytime we can accommodate tools to make a part in either measuring system, um, you're going you're gonna to open up some of your choices vendor-wise, so um, keep that in mind. So that is uh, para, er, corner radii which run parallel to the cutter. Let's move over and look at horizontal fillets. This is a demo part which has kind of uh, a lot of uh, nasty features. The first one I want to look at is this floor pocket. So the thing to note here is the radii on the floor are the same size as the vertical radii. And that creates a situation where the, the floor geometry has a sharp corner. And so it looks all filleted, but really this is a sharp cornered pocket now. Like if we come in here with a bullnose end mill, you'll see we can't get all the way into that corner to machine it because the end mill is making a sharp stop and a little bit of stock gets left in the corner. The only way you can really machine this feature to match CAD is to use a ball end mill and lots of small step overs. Um, this isn't necessarily awful on a small pocket. It's not a huge amount of runtime. 
Um, you do run into problems like when you go to a huge pocket like this. So what you might have to end up doing here is cutting the floor of this big pocket with a regular end mill and then going in and kind of picking out the corners. And blending tools, anytime I have to blend two tools to get a cohesive surface, that becomes expensive uh, because that doesn't happen right out of the gate. Um, there's usually a test cut measure and adjust process. So um, the other thing with doing the ball finish, uh, oftentimes tolerance has a needed surface finish. So if you have a cusp surface, the cusping should be about 10% of your tolerance. So if you're trying to hold like 10 microns, you probably want a one micron cusp height. And so all of a sudden those step overs get very, very close together and that can affect uh, runtime. So uh, let's look at the cusp. So you'd have a ball end mill come in here, uh, lots of uh, lots of tiny step overs, and you can see these little little peaks forming. But it does allow you to get all the way into this sharp corner and finish out those walls. Um, if this is like a, a weight pocket, you can make those step overs pretty wide, and it looks actually pretty good. Um, but it's not necessarily the best thing if you're trying to install an insert because you're you're resting on peaks. So uh, I prefer when I have a pocket to cut that something important is going in to uh, do it like this, where the floor corner radii are about half the size of the the tool radii, the vertical facing radii, and um, that just uh, goes a lot easier. Here we go. So the way that looks is you have what's called a bullnose end mill. Um, has a corner radius which can match the corner radius of the part pocket. And it takes significantly wider step overs, but it's also going to be a much flatter surface. So that's pocket radii and things to watch out for. Um, now let's look at uh, corner rounding radii on external corners. So uh, external corners like this, um, in volume applications, we could use what's called a corner rounding tool. And uh, that basically has the negative shape of the radius you want, and it mills it onto the part. And uh, those work pretty well. Uh, I have no major concerns when uh, using them in volume. But one thing, I tend to avoid them on low volume stuff. Uh, because there's so many varieties of corner radii sizes and um, inch metric sizes that for me it's just easier to approach corner radii like that with a bull nose or uh, ball end mill and uh, I put them on like this I'll just kind of wrap a tool path around the part with a ball end mill and that's uh, a lot less tools I have to keep in stock um, but the other issue with using these on low volume stuff is the, the tool radius relative to the tip of the tool usually has some manufacturing tolerance on that tool. Um, it's not unusual to touch the tool off and have to adjust it a few thou one way or the other upon first cut. It's very, very rare that you take a cut and you have uh, that radius be very tangential to both the top and side face. Um, there's usually almost always some offsetting. So in production, that's no big deal. But for a one-off, I, I get annoyed where, with that. Whereas using a ball mill, um, my ball mills have a three micron tolerance on the form of the ball. So it's very, very easy to get right out of the gate a beautiful tangential surface. Um, now, things to watch out for with corner rounding end mills is they have this pilot diameter and they have a outer diameter. So this sometimes means uh, they can't get the fillet all the way into a corner. So like this, where the fillet runs right into this wall, it would never get there. And in this scenario where the fillet runs into a vertical fillet, there's gonna be stock left there. Uh, and that's going to look like that. So um, if done right, it, it can be an okay looking part. 
still. Uh, it's usually not too sharp. Uh, the problem is, is so we have this little wisp of stock there. If you have some kind of component budding into that area, where that stock is left, there's going to be an interference. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking out for when I see corner fillets, is I want to know how the components are interacting with that corner fillet. The better way to do it from a design perspective is to uh, actually sketch a path and sweep that fillet onto the part, because then you know precisely how the cutter is going to leave material. You know what it's going to look like, and you could plan for it. Um, so the last thing to look out for on these uh, corner rounding end mills is the pilot diameter needs to be able to access all the features. So like here we have this slot that the pilot diameter can't get into. And so if I were given this part, what I would have to do is uh, take a much smaller end mill and blend in there. And back to blending, anytime I have to blend two features together and do a cohesive surface, there's going to be some test cutting. Um, test cutting and the nature of 3D machining being lots of small cuts, uh, it really adds up time in a, in a one-off environment. Um, so that's, that's a scenario we like to avoid. All right, so uh, the final uh, thing I want to talk about is, this is pretty common on like uh, small die applications where you have lots of very small wire EDM'd components that are press or slip fit together. So for whatever reason, people kind of forget, they see like ultra small wire EDM, like 50 micron wire, and they think it's a sharp corner all of a sudden. In reality, it's just a 25 micron corner radius. So uh, we have our pink part and our purple part, and our pink part, has a 25 micron corner radius left behind from wire EDM, and the uh, the purple part gets installed without any kind of accommodations to that sharp corner, and so the sharp corner is going to interfere with the corner radius. And every time that's going to bind up at assembly. So you really need to understand that no matter the process, there's probably going to be an, an internal radius. Um, it could be grinding wheel with a thousand grit wheel, and there's still going to be like a couple tenths radius. Um, end mills so sharp that make you bleed still live a little bit of a radius. And we're, we're talking minute scales, but when you're dealing with like near press fits, uh, uh, very tight slip fits, it doesn't take much for them to bind up. And if you're dealing with brittle materials, you don't really want to force those two together. So yeah, just make sure you're mating part, the male corner has some kind of uh, slightly larger radius, or it could even be a chamfer like that. So, uh, yeah, you, you can't leave things unexpected like that. Uh, as long as you understand there's going to be a corner radius and you plan for it and plan how the mating parts are going to interact, interact with it, uh, your, your assembly should go together much better. So, um, if you, found value in this, let me know if there's like another feature that you see on parts a lot that you would like to hear my perspectives on. Um, I'd consider like maybe a heat treated part video that seems to have like a lot of gate kept knowledge within the tool making community that doesn't really percolate out to the design world. Um, and maybe, I don't know, micro milling, I could probably rant about that a little, but, uh, I'd say that covers uh, most of my major complaints about champ for, or fillets for the moment, so let me know if that was helpful.